Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be here this afternoon. Thanks so much to uh, Judy Beck and to all of you for having me. So Judy gave a pretty um, good introduction for my professional background and educational background, but I just want to tell you a little bit about myself personally. I grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, and um, so grew up with water, you know, right, right there in front of me. And I, through a little bit of a circuitous path, uh, studied science and eventually settled on environmental science, started focusing on water issues, and then eventually got a degree in environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin. And my research there was on water quality in Lake Mendota the Lake Mendota watershed and nutrient cycling in that system. And now I work for the US Geological Survey. So I'm gonna give a little bit more background about what the US GS does. So we are a federal agency within the Department of the Interior. We are non-regulatory, don't do any enforcement, and the, the goal, the mission really, is to produce unbiased scientific information so USGS provides scientific information about natural ha hazards, so earthquakes and volcanoes are one, a couple of topics that you all may have um, heard about USGS being involved in. Water, energy, minerals, and other natural resources that uh, society relies on, and also the impacts of climate and land use change. The USGS water mission in particular has the goals of observing, understanding, predicting, and delivering timely water information. So we know that um, water information is very fundamental to both national and local decision-making economies, protecting human health, environmental health, et cetera. So we work with partners across the landscape to monitor, assess, do targeted research, and then make this uh, data and information available. Often our work is organized into these four categories, which roughly align with the budget program. So we, we are, um, you know, have appropriations from Congress that roughly align with these four topics, stream flow and groundwater, water quality and water availability and use. So I certainly do not need to tell this group that water issues abound. Uh, in fact, you all have, um, you've been telling me about water issues I wasn't even aware of. So there are increasing pressures on limited freshwater resources in the United States and um, across the globe. These range from issues related to aging infrastructure, spills, including the Gold King Mine spill, that's one that, um, maybe in recent memory. And then issues that are more, issues of um, pollution that are more widespread. So this, this issue of plastic in the environment, um, microplastics is an area of research that USGS has um, been active in in the last several years. And you know, these are, these are really only a few. So obviously we are putting a lot of stress on our water resources. But there are, you know, there are um, a lot of data out there, and increasingly with the advancements in technology related to sensing, in situ sensing, so sensors that are actually placed in the environment. Um, we heard a little bit about that earlier from Mary, remote sensing technologies, et cetera. There is um, increasingly more and more information available about water resources. And the US Geological Survey is the largest provider of in situ water data in the world. And what that means is um, water observations that are, that are actually made in stream or in lakes or in groundwater. So what that does would not include is um, remotely sensed information, which USGS does do a little bit of, but there are other agencies that have us beat there. Every year, USGS water delivers more than a billion successful data requests tens of terabytes of data. We make publicly accessible our scientific reports and publications, and the main source of information, water information, which would be probably the first place to go, would be waterdata.usgs.gov. I wanna say now, you can see the URL here. I've also prepared a printed 
handout and there's a stack of them in the front of the room that have a number of the resources that I'm going to be talking about today and the URLs associated with them. So feel free to come to the front of the room. And this is another thing that I can make available to Judy to distribute if you would prefer to have a digital copy. Okay, so we have a lot of water issues on our plates to deal with as a society. I'm telling you, there's a lot of data out there, um, but it is not always easy to find, even if you're considering federal resources or maybe especially if you're considering federal resources. So there are a lot of challenges to finding water data out there on the web or by other means. Beyond the US Geological Survey, there are, I believe the number is something like 13 federal agencies that deal in water information. There are hundreds of state, local, tribal, and other entities that make water observations and make those available in some way, shape, or form. So there's data all over the place. And the challenges that are can be associated with um, finding this, they put a very large burden on users of the data, people who are trying to access those data to do something with them. One of the first challenges, and these are probably going to be common to the people in this room that have worked on uh, watershed reports um, and pulling, pulling together um, water information for the studies that I've heard about this afternoon. One of the first challenges with this is that there are a number of different data delivery um, media, so through websites, web services, like an application programming interface is another way to access data. You might be able to access data by making a request to someone through email. Maybe someone actually sends you a printed report or a, a, a disk that has data on it, and probably by other means as well. So there are all kinds of different ways that you can actually get at data and information. The format of the data, so many different formats out there. Maybe you have a, a PDF that's actually you know, a, a, a digital PDF. Maybe you have a, a scan of some um, table that was just copied in. Comma separated uh, files. JSON is another format that is increasingly common and a number of others. So if you wanna bring data together, you may have to consider these different formats and that puts a, that puts a burden on the user. There are a number of different data formats in terms of the way that the data is structured and metadata associated with a particular record also may vary. So as an example, let's say I have a temperature sensor and I take it down the street and lower it down over the bridge. I'm not sure of the name of the bridge that's just over here, but I lower it down and drop the sensor into the water. Um, I was using, a, I would, if I were to do that, I would be using a particular sensor. Um, I, I'm doing that at a particular time, moment in time, at a particular location. There's uncertainty associated with that measure. Um, and a number of other pieces of metadata or data about that particular observation, which might just be, oh, the water is, you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. There's other data associated with that point that is very important for the use, uh, additional use, and we refer to that as metadata. It comes in many different formats. And then another challenge associated with finding and using water data is that there are a number of different measurement methods, and those can be challenging to translate across. So all of this, all together, makes it quite, as I've said, quite challenging to bring together data from different sources, to integrate it, to make it consistent and unambiguous. That's something that is um, important when you're wanting to establish, use data to establish, um, uh, test a hypothesis, is that your data is unambiguous. Okay, so we have these challenges and there has been a movement in recent years that is, has been really evident in the federal government. So I'm gonna tell this story from the federal, federal water data perspective, but the open data movement is something that is really happening across the landscape in other sectors as well. 
Um, we are living in the information age, and so there has been, at the federal level, a recognition of challenges and improvements that could be made, whether through regulatory mechanisms or otherwise to improve access to federal data. So thus was born what I'm terming the federal open data movement. Um, the Obama administration um, made a push for open data in 2013. So this was a, a memorandum, so a, a, a policy to make um, data open, also to make source code open. So computer code that is used to um, process data, making, making that open if it's um, uh, a federal resource. And also to make publications and reports that are funded with federal dollars open. So how does this connect to um, water data? Well, this is very relevant to water data. And We'll talk about that next. Okay, so the next step in this was something called the Climate Data Initiative. This was also initiative, an initiative during the Obama administration, and this was a, a big effort to make a catalog, so not necessarily to bring all of the data together, but just to get a catalog, a list of what federal data resources were available related to climate. So at the URL data.gov slash climate, you can find um, a whole slew, probably tens of thousands of data sets from federal agencies related to climate, and water was one of the themes within this. So our office uh, then, at that time it was called the USGS Office of Water Information, was, was uh, actively involved in pulling together water data resources for this initiative. And out of that then grew something called the Federal Open Water Data Initiative. So you can kind of see we're, we're, we're focusing in here on, on water data and water information. This initiative was spearheaded by then Assistant Secretary for Water and Science in the Department of the Interior, Ann Castle. And this activity was started out of the Advisory Committee on Water Information. So this brings it home to um, the FACA that we had, that has been mentioned a couple of times already, this ACWI Advisory Committee on Water Information. So what this, what this group did was to take a look at water data and the challenges associated with it and to say, what, you know, what do we need to do here with water data to make it more accessible, recognizing those challenges that I stepped through earlier. And so there's a conceptual framework associated with it that starts with making a catalog so that you know what is, is out there just to start with. You can see mention of consensus standards, so getting those formats standardized. Coupling water data to hydrologic features is another, in my view, very exciting aspect of this work so that when an observation is made, you, don't, you have more than just a lat long or maybe associated with a county or municipality or state, but you can actually associate it, that with the place on the river network, the hydrologic network. And then the last idea here is just this recognition that if you make the data available and provide tools for people to access the data, then there will be more activities um, that arise as a result of it. So bringing us to the topic at hand, the Internet of Water, um, I'm going to talk a, a, a little bit about this concept, the Internet of Water, and this report that came out of the Aspen Institute dialogue series on water data. So the Aspen Institute, for those of you who may not be familiar, it's a nonpartisan forum for values-based leadership and the exchange of ideas. Um, it's been around since after World War II. And in 2016, the Aspen Institute Annual Water Forum, um, uh, it, uh, in that forum, um, there was identified this challenge of sharing an integrated water data across sectors. So private sector, public sector, nonprofit, um, et cetera. And this institute convened a number of meetings to look into this a little bit further and to see if they could make some recommendations. What is different about this activity in 2017 as opposed to the previous three is that it's actually taking it beyond the federal government, including um, representation and views from, from more than just the federal government, from the um, other uh, 
levels of government and from the private sector as well. So for the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is to step you through the recommendations of this report so that you've got a sense of what's in it. You can also find it on the web and read it yourself. And for a couple of these recommendations that the report makes, I'm going to give some examples of how USGS is kind of actively working in this area. So the first finding for the Internet of Water is this um, concept that open water data, the value of open water data really has not been quantified. So we know that water has a value, of course, but what about water data? If you have water data in, in your hands, what can you do? What cost savings can you make across, you know, for whatever topic you care about? Um, what can you do with that data? So that's, there's the recognition um, that the value of data needs to be quantified and communicated. Making existing public water data open across state, local, and the federal government is a priority. And then third, there's an, there's an architecture, and it, kind of an information architecture that has been recommended. And I'm gonna speak to that a little bit more in the next slide, but um, for this, there's a recognition that the, the, the groups that are making water observations need to maintain some ownership over those. So as the, you know, someone from the USGS, we're not saying, hey, everyone, just give us your data and we'll take care of them. No, people, that's not, some, that's not um, an idea that, that uh, water data providers are generally comfortable with. So this architecture, which is kind of shown in a schematic here, is a way to conceptualize this need for data providers to actually maintain ownership over their, uh, over their data holdings. So what you can see here are circles of a few different colors. You've got USGS indicated as both a data producer and a data hub. So we, we produce data and we also make states data available. And I'll get to that um, in a couple of slides. But you also have groups like the Western States Water Council Water Data Exchange. So the Western States Water Council is a trusted broker of water use data for Western states. And the Western states are able to, um, uh, again, mainta maintain ownership over that data, but um, make it available in all together in a single portal for water use. The state of Texas has a lot of water data too. We heard about the uh, water, um, Texas Water Board earlier. They're also a data producer and a data hub. And then you've got users that are connected. So this is the uh, conceptual framework for how the data, you know, will there be one massive database where everything is stored? No, that's not the solution that's being recommended here. So the recommendations described in this report are shown here. First, articulate a vision for uh, what, for the value of water data and making a business case for investing in making water data open enabling open water data, so looking to communities that are already sharing water data and see if there are lessons learned or technologies that can be shared. And then finally, connecting regional data sharing communities to actually create this internet of water. So now I'll step into some of these specific examples. So I already spoke a little bit about making a compelling case for investing in water data sharing. So there's an opportunity that exists currently for governments, academia, the private sector, et cetera, to quantify the, the um, values and benefits. And that's one of the things that the Internet of Water proposes doing, which is a good thing. Okay, the second recommendation here is about regional pilots that solve near-term water management problems for key stakeholders through shared and integrated water data. So recognizing that most water issues are local and regional in scale, a number of regional pilots are being initiated. And one of the examples here that I want to share with you all is around water use information. So water is withdrawn and used for um, uh, public supply, for agriculture, irrigation, uh, irrigation industrial uses. Um, Etc. And the USGS is actually congressionally mandated on a five-year basis to produce national reports of water use at the, uh, down to the resolution of the county scale. Since 1950, the USGS has reported this information, so we've had, we have a really long-term and consistent record of water use at the national scale. 
And um, just this past month, the 2015 report was released. So here we are in 2018, and the, the 2015 report was released. And that, the delay there, that latency in the data, is in part related to how the data are collected. Um, this is a, an image of the water use by county. Green represents irrigation, yellow represents thermoelectric, public supply, industrial, and others. So you can kind of get a picture of the, at the national scale for 2015, what water withdrawals looked like. And this is really cool. I love being able to show you this great map. Um, and there's actually a website that has a, an interactive data visualization where you can zoom down to the county level. Um, but can we, you know, and here I mean we as USGS, society, all of you, can we tolerate waiting three years to get this information? It's, that's quite a long lag. Um, we have droughts that come and go in between reports. And we're living in an information age. We have the Internet of Things, smart sensors, um, real-time data on things like traffic, weather, biometrics, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an opportunity to do better here. Along those lines, and coming back to this focus on a regional pilot, um, the Western States Water Council, as I mentioned, they are a trusted broker of water use information for Western states. So the desired outcome of this particular pilot that's happening as through the Advisory Committee on Water Information, but very closely linked with these Internet of Water uh, activities, is to find a shared, develop, collaborati collaboratively de develop a shared data model and shared exchange protocols for this water data. And that might sound a little um, boring to this group. I don't know. I, I personally find it to be pretty interesting. but it is very difficult to share the water use data across these entities. And one of the reasons that our water availability and use science program takes years to pull data together from states is because it's done in a very much in a manual way through email um, and through a lot of labor on the data. So there's an opportunity here. And this program is um, setting up to pivot to estimating water use at higher spatial and temporal resolutions, which I think is gonna be a really great thing. But we've gotta have easier access to the data in order to do it. So this collaboration is about this, about getting, um, getting the data uh, available, making the data available more easily. And there's discussion about an analog to the Western States Water Council water data exchange for eastern states. So there is not an entity like that for eastern states that is kind of a trusted broker of those data. So that's the opportunity there with a regional pilot. Okay, the second recommendation, one of the second recommendations is to, to develop water data catalogs that identify all existing public water data maintained by states. And wow, is that a tall order. Um, this is an image of a harmful algal bloom taken la last September on the western basin of Lake Erie by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. In 2014, um, about a half million people were left without access to sta safe drinking water in Toledo because of a harmful algal bloom in the western basin. And at that time, USGS was called upon to provide data and actionable information about the causes and consequences, which we did. Uh, but it was not as fast as anyone would have liked. And there are other examples of water quality crises in which it takes days, weeks, or longer to bring together the information needed to understand what's happening. So on this point, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a resource called the Water Quality Portal, and that's one that is, um, the URL is shown on the sheet here. So this is a multi-agency water quality data portal uh, the EPA, USGS, US Department of Agriculture, and the Advisory Committee on Water Information collaborated to create this resource. And what it does is basically pull together uh, mil hundreds of millions of records from states uh, through the EPA, combines them with USGS water quality data, and that from um, USDA in a common format. So you can go and um, find data and it all gets returned in a single tab table with a common metadata um, format there. 
I think this is a resource that may be of interest to folks like yourselves, and so I encourage you to go check it out. And another really cool feature here, which is um, the little map icon in the lower left-hand corner there is a functionality that actually allows you to search upstream and downstream from a given location on the river network for data. Yeah, I think that's a pretty cool thing. And you can specify the length and whether you want to include tributaries or um, diversions. So, that's, yes? Sure, it is HTTPS colon slash slash waterqualitydata.us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. If, oh yes, the question was what is, the question is whether you can search upstream and downstream from a particular location on the network. Well, there's data that go back more than 100 years. The USGS has some data from quite a long time ago that are included in this portal, but it's, um, yeah, it's from a lot of different, up to, I believe that the, I believe the data are refreshed on something like, a, it's either daily or weekly from, e, from EPA's Storat and from the USGS database. So on top of that, so, so this system has, there's a web portal so you can go and interact with these drop down menus to select the information that you're interested in. And there are also tools that are built on top of the system for accessing the data. And I'm gonna say a little bit about how those tools and data can be used. So the second recommendation is about developing tools. And I would like to give you an example. This is an applied research example where in the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, there was a, a need by the fisheries managers in those states to make inform, better, more informed decisions about stocking choices. So specifically around the question of walleye versus largemouth bass. Walleye prefer cooler waters, largemouth bass prefer, prefer warmer waters, and there's been an, um, observation of lakes kind of sw having a, a state change in which fish dominate, but walleye are preferred, and there's a big recreational industry in these states. So the Departments of Natural Resource for Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and the USGS and the University of Wisconsin set out to make predictions of lake temperature looking out, um, out as far as a century into the, into the future. And so what you're seeing here are results of the numerical models that were run for a, uh, just a subset of the lakes. And you can see it marching through time and the water changing temperature. Now what, is, what does this have to do with the water quality portal? Well, in order to run simulations of tens of thousands of lakes, you have to have data to calibrate and validate those models to see how well you're doing, whether you're accurate or not. So that system was used, and really this research couldn't have been done without the water quality portal. So this is somewhat of a research and you know, kind of a, maybe a bit more of an academic example, but it has really important applied um, uses so that the, these departments of natural resource can make good decisions about where they are stocking, putting investments in stocking, fish stocking. All right, so the last couple of recommendations here, and this may be stating the obvious, existing water data hubs such as the USGS or the Western States Water Council, a number of others, they should be stabilized and further resourced. So I'm gonna say a little bit about the USGS water, our appropriated budget outlook. So in FY18, we do now have a budget from Congress, which is great. Um, and we did see, the water mission area did see a modest increase from FY, the fiscal year 17. And in the House mark, so kind of the proposed budget that we have seen right now, not the President's budget, but the House of Representatives, we have, um, there's proposed a 13.5 million increase for water observing system modernization. And this potentially could have some good um, impacts for stabilizing and further resourcing our information systems. Last recommendation is this one to create a backbone organization that would structure and enable a system of federated data. So say there's data being observed on 
um, farms in Iowa, and the farmers are willing to share those information and maybe aggregate it up to some certain, to some scale. It would be great if there was an entity that could be a broker of that information to help make it available. So that's what's being proposed here. It's been, been proposed that it's a nonprofit organization that has a cooperative agreement with um, some kind of a federal agency. So I'm really pleased to say that a couple of the folks that were involved in the Internet of Water Aspen Institute activities, Martin Doyle and Lauren Patterson, they've actually secured uh, funding from a, from a number of private foundations to establish this organization to actually do work on this. And they have resources secured to have um, a couple of technologists and communications people, and they'll both be involved. So this is really great, and um, we do have in the works some kind of a cooperative agreement between this entity and with USGS. So with regard to those recommendations, we have a long way to go, certainly. I've given a couple of examples of how USGS is involved and is working to push things th these things forward. And the last thing I wanted to say was just that USGS, I've heard there, the, you all are so curious and interested and passionate about water issues in your particular regions, and I think that's really wonderful. And I want to mention that the USGS does have water science centers in all 50 states and in Puerto Rico. And at these water science centers, there are all kinds of local research being done on issues of the kind I think people like you would be interested in. So just to take Wisconsin as an example, there's research on microplastics in the Great Lakes, impact of coal tar sands mining on groundwater quality and availability, human and bovine viruses in urban streams, edge of field monitoring, impacts of road salts on surface water, and just on and on and on. Um, a lot of really great work being done, and you know that's just in, in the state of Wisconsin. So this would be um, potentially a great resource if you're interested in learning more about water in your area. And the last thing I'm gonna do here is just show on the screen what is printed on the card here, and Judy Beck encouraged me to save time for questions and discussion and potentially demos of some of these things, so hopefully we still have time for some of that. Um, thank you for your attention.